All right, we're recording, I think. Yeah. Yes, recording in progress. Okay. And you guys will have the recording after the fact. Anyway, so um, the Edge server gives users access to all the link services without a VPN. Um, there's three components to the Edge, or, or four, I guess, components to the Edge. I'm going to cover the access proxy, which is Access Edge, and uh, media traversal um, for audio and video calls and, and desktop sharing and link. Um, and it also provides federation and public IM connectivity um, and online meetings to external anonymous users um, or external federated users or, or anything. So um, what the Edge doesn't provide is anything that's a website. So this is where the reverse proxy role comes in. This is the address book, DL expansion, um, which is a website on the front end director, and then the landing pages for the simple URLs meet and dialing, which is also websites on front end or director. So I guess the simplest thing is anything that is a website um, goes to the reverse proxy. Everything else that's actually protocol based, go, uh, the set protocol based goes to the edge server. Um, so some terms to know um, for what I'm going to talk about are, are as follows. Um, MRAS, ICE, Candidate, Turn, Stun, NAT, and SDP. I'll probably use these. Uh, um, MRAS and ICE are probably the most important. MRAS is the is a service that runs on the internal interface of the Edge server. Um, AV authentication service, media relay authentication service, um, and and ICE is the inter interactive connectivity establishment protocol, which is um, key to all communications in link, either internal or external, to establish media. Um, this next deck I'm not going to read off, but this is basically just something to have as a reference of the kind of the full definitions of these in case anybody gets into like a quiz or whatever, but I, I don't know, this is kind of the, you know, this is what turn, ice, and stun are um, in the real definition as far as the Microsoft um, definition is. So with that said, um, uh, those are the kind of things I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, I was just curious uh, in regards to this protocol stuff. Um, just, just at a, like an FYI, or if you could provide the FYI, do you know who's responsible for, um, I guess, putting these protocols together? Is it IBM? Is it Microsoft? Is it Cisco? So they they all start out as um, um, industry standard IETF protocols. Um, but what you'll notice is, um, so for ICE, for example, ICE is an, is an IETF protocol. There's an RFC on there. I, I don't know off the top of my head. But Microsoft has a version called MS-ICE, and that's basically their extensions, the way that they're using ICE. So they take the, the industry standard. Um, there's not a ton that they do that isn't standard, but that kind of offers them the ability to customize it. And the same thing for um Stun, I believe, or uh, yeah, it's either yeah they have stun and they have turn, so it, it is an IETF thing. Um, I, I don't know much more other than that, um, but Microsoft is uh, is responsible for any customization that they do and how they make their application use it, which is where it becomes a Microsoft MS Dash type protocol. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just curious. Um the travels of, of dealing with all these protocols, it, there's kind of the assumption that maybe Microsoft put these all together. But in my career throughout Microsoft, IBM has certainly done a lot, and Cisco's done a lot also. So I'm just curious. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I don't know um, where they started. Um, I don't know who did the RFCs originally, but that's kind of the idea. My, these were pre existing protocols. Microsoft inherited these, they did not create these. Um, okay, so so the easiest part, I think, on the Edge server is the Access Edge. Um, I just want to cover that in a couple slides to go over what's going on there. Um, I keep referring to it lately as a SIP access proxy because that's kind of what the Access Edge does. And um, in other industry applications, it, something is referred to as a SIP access proxy, not an Access Edge server. Um, basically... It proxies SIP messages over TLS and MTLS um, between users and between servers. Um, 
And what you can see is you can actually, you know, things to look out for. This And this screenshot here is a, is a snooper trace of a message. Um, you can look for look for SIP invite and SIP message. That's where you're going to see. These are IMs, basically, right? Um, and actual message content can show in a message, which is um, pretty easy to understand, or a 200 OK um, and an invite. So what you'll actually, I guess the key about this that, this slide is if you're ever looking at snooper logs and you're trying to figure out if IMs are getting there, which isn't often that people actually have to troubleshoot this stuff, but this big block of unreadable text, that's an IM. Um, so that's the encrypted message. So that's just something I wanted to show in case any, nobody's ever seen um, that before or wondered what that was. That's that's an instant message being sent um, through the access edge. Um, this diagram here is pulled from the resource kit chapter. Basically, this is what happens with an intern, external and internal user. Um, it's a pretty basic... Um, Keep going. Oh. It, it's a pretty basic exchange. Basically, there's SIP invites, SIP 200 OKs, SIP messages, and then SIP buys. So um, all of this information that I'm going to talk about, too, is covered in much more detail in the resource kit chapter. Um, but basically, you're, you're, you, this is the most simple exchange of communications you can have between users back and forth. One user sends an invite, the other guy sends a 200 OK, then they start sending messages, um, and then somebody closes the window and that's a sit by message. Um, uh, and then another thing I wanted to cover related to this is how to determine what um, a federation IM looks like um, outside of having a from and to address being outside of the domain, obviously. Um, actually, federation messages get tagged as um, with this MS Edge proxy message trust um, attribute. And basically that outlines what type of federation this is. So this one here that we're looking at in this picture was an auto federation using the SRV records to this server, um, and it's a verified user, right? So you can also see this with public IM. It will say um, public IM and, and things like that. So it just kind of helps you figure out um, where that is, and this would be in a SIP 100 trying message. So again, um, just, something, just something to reference if you're ever looking for that stuff. Um, and one other key thing as far as SIP messages go that I think is always is, is a crucial thing to know is for every SIP proxy, which is an access edge director or front end, there will be a record route created. So any type of message, whether it's part of, if it's a SIP message, it will get a record route stamped in there for every server it passes through. So this is great in troubleshooting. Um, you can really see that, uh, you can really see where everything is going. And again, this is all encrypted. You can only see this if you actually run Snooper either on the client or on the server side. So you don't have to worry about this getting intercepted anywhere and people seeing server names and ports. But um, if you're an admin trying to figure out um, what's going wrong or trying to figure out routing issues, this is really crucial because it really shows everything there. Um, so if you're ever looking for that, just search for record route and you'll be able to see pool names, server names, IP addresses, or everything that it passed through. So any questions about the access edge stuff? Like I said, I usually tend to think it's one of the more simpler ones. I just wanted to get it out of the way, but um, anything specific that you guys have around that, just let me know. All right, um, so now on to the fun stuff. Um, basically, uh, we're going to cover what's involved in media relay. So when I say media relay, I'm talking any type of external user and link trying to talk to either an internal user, a federated user, um, MSN user, things like that. Um, so these are the phases of establishing a media path. There's a phase during logon, which is where MRAS comes in, and that's also, if you were referring to it more on an industry standard type terms, it's a turn provisioning um, and for turn credentials. Um, and then when, when a user, so that's during logon, that happens automatically, and then when a user is actually establishing a call, there's five phases there. Address discovery, address exchange, connectivity checks, candidate promotion, and then finally media flow. So I'm going to cover each of these phases um, in detail next. 
basically, as a quick definition um, for what MRAS is, is, and I told you this, the Media Relay Authentication Service lives on the internal Edge Server interface. Um, when a user signs on, internal or external, they make a request for Media Relay credentials if um, an Edge Server is configured in their topology. And what this does is provides users with the information to start any type of media session. And another thing to note is that conferencing servers also request MRAS credentials. Um, so the AVMCU and the web app and conferencing MCUs will um, also request MRAS credentials when the service starts um, so that they can be communicating with remote participants. Um, another thing that, you know, it just came my, popped to my head today because we're working on it and something to think about is if you start integrating with things like Polycom um, for video conferencing and, and, and what they're doing with Link, they're following these same protocols, so your Polycom systems will be uh, giving MRAS credentials, um, your RMX or HDXs will be using the same thing. So if you're investigating that at all, um, this deck will be helpful in that as well because it's, essentially the same um, same protocols that are being used for those HDX and RMX systems. Um, this next deck is another reference deck just to, it actually helped me a lot in the beginning was to, um, what the things to look for, and these are the things to look for when you're actually looking in those traces using Snooper or those UCC API logs that are on the, um, on the client, and th this is how to kind of identify those different phases in these logs. Um, I won't read through all of them, but um, basically you can search for these these um, keywords in the log to be able to see those different phases. Um, this diagram here outlines the uh, MRAS call flow, and I'm calling it a call flow even though it's, there's not really a call there, but it's really the message exchange for this. So when the user signs in, they send a SIP register, um, and at that point, um, the front-end server actually sends an MRAS request to the edge server uh, on the internal interface. Um, the, the user actually initiates the request, but it's sent through the front-end, and, and that, that will come across in a service message that's, that's sent to the internal interface of the front-end. The front-end will validate that message, generate credentials, and send a response back to the front-end and then the front end will deliver that response to the user. Um, and this is an outline of what the, pack, what the actual SIP packets look like. So this is an MRAS request from the client. Um, you'll notice here it's a service message. Um, from will be the user that it's from, and then to will be the internal FQDN of your Edge server. Um, a couple key things in here really are the location and the, and the duration. So location, like I said, internal and external users will request this. So this is taken from an internet user. Um, this could also say intranet for internal users. The duration is 480, um, uh, geez, I'm trying to complete that, 480 seconds, I believe. It's been a long day. I had an early flight. Um, <laughs> anyways. This is, uh, this is just the, the request here. Um, then that user is going to get a, a message back from, like I said, it actually routes through the front end, but it's from the edge server. Um, and what that's going to provide is a username and password. And the username and password I'll discuss in a minute, but those are used for media um, encryption and, and port allocation. And it's also going to provide a host name and port for a media relay list. So these are your edge server public DNS names. So this basically tells um, what this means at this point is the user is signed on, they get their MRAS credentials, which you always hear referred to, and that means that now they know if they want to make a call or an app sharing session or anything, they need to contact avedgeexternal.contoso.com on 3478 or 443 before initiating the media session. Um, and that has to happen, and, and if you're internal, you're contacting the internal interface of the Edge server on those ports. Um, one of the things, if you're ever troubleshooting call setup issues, if you're noticing a delay in call setup for internal users, where they're, um, you know, getting the beep like five or ten times before they make the call, that's usually pointing to an MRAS issue where they actually can't establish that connection even if they don't need it. They, they still have to try. So, um, 
just that's something important to note. Even if you have two internal users calling or making a PSTM call, they will always do this. So, so if you're ever experiencing issues with that, that's a place to look. Um, at this point, then, we're going to, and the next step in the process is address allocation and negotiation. And this is really where a lot of the ice stun and turn stuff comes in. So, any questions on the MRAS stuff before I move on? It's a kind of a loaded thing. The, the simplest thing about it is um, you, can, you can figure the AV Edge pool and topology builder, and that's where users are getting this information and requesting. It usually just works. Um, if it doesn't, it's usually a, a deeper issue. Okay. Um, so, I, this, this call flow that I actually have up here, again, these diagrams are from the resource kit. This is for um, a standard peer-to-peer -peer call. So, this really covers the ICE uh, scenario, um, but this also is for a full peer-to-peer -peer call. So, when... When a, and I'm going to cover what this, these steps are and then get into them in more detail after the fact. But basically, like with the IMs, there's an invite sent, obviously. Um, in that SIP invite that the, uh, the external link user sends, they're going to send a candidate list. And, and I'll cover what those are. Um, and they're basically how, they're, how these guys are going to talk. Um, a 200 OK is sent back. And in this case, it's going to be routed through the Edge server. And that SIP message from the, the callee is going to um, also contain candidates. At that point, this red line here, these are this is the address um, negotiation here where they're doing these uh, connectivity checks. And these ICE connectivity checks are happening. Um, and then finally, um, once they, they validate that they can talk, um, they're going to send back another SIP 200 OK validating that, and they're going to start sending media. So... Steps one through um, five happen before any media is sent, um, and, I, and I'm going to show you kind of how that all breaks down. There's actually a lot going on behind the scenes, right, when you click call, which is, is pretty crazy to see. Um, so uh, to, to start it off, we'll just talk about ICE for a second. So candidates um, are a combination, and this is kind of a, a long-winded definition, but this is usually the best way that I can put it, is a combination of available IP addresses and randomly allocated TCP or UDP ports within the configured port ranges for the link client. And the reason why I threw in that last part is you can configure whether you're doing QoS in your environment or you want to restrict the port range, um, you can configure uh, a set at a minimum of 20 per modality port ranges. So those candidates on a, on a client are uh, allocated out of that port range which is actually typically the, the 50,000 port range on the high-end port range there. Um, there's three types of candidates. So this here is in the simplest scenario, because this can actually get pretty complicated, um, but in the simplest scenario, a user at home behind a home router, like your standard Cisco or Linksys router, has um, an internal IP address, which is the IP address assigned to the network interface, a reflexive, which is actually the public address of the, the home router, um, in whatever scenario this is, this, can, this is actually really referred to the public IP address of the closest NAT. Um, and I'll show you what that actually looks like in the messages. Um, and then a media relay address. So this is the, the AV Edge address. Um, one thing to remember um, is that every IP address in the client is a candidate, including VPN addresses. So I actually have a blog post coming out on next top. Um, we're targeting before the um, holiday breaks come up, so end of November, we should have this thing live. That's basically going to cover um, what this bullet item means, but basically, as a warning, if you are using a client VPN solution, SSL or IPsec, um, those are interfaces and those are IP addresses, and if you don't want, if you have an edge server, you don't want that traffic going over the VPN for quality reasons, so just something to think about. And like I said, that post will kind of cover in much greater detail what the problem is and how to get around it with a couple configuration options. But um, that's why I said it can get really complicated because, um, you know, I have I have an instance of VMware Workstation on my machine. So when I send an invite to somebody, I have, like, 20 IP addresses that come across as candidates, even though they're just these virtual mix. So um, that's where you'll notice that this is just an industry standard protocol that Microsoft picked up and didn't really – Put, they didn't want to manipulate it because this is how it works and this is what it's meant to do. So, so 
With all that said, um, this is the process. Remember I said there's the phasers, there's allocation. So what an allocation is, is you basically have to, those ports and everything are defined, but they're not allocated for a call until you want to make a call. So when you actually hit the call button on your link client, um, before the SIP invite is sent, the user has to allocate with the ABS server using those credentials that it got provided earlier. So what you see here is actually a allocate request going from my workstation, this is like an internal 192.168.1.138 address, to the AV Edge public IP on 3478 UDP. So this is me saying, hey, I want to make a call, give me an IP address and port to use, and this is where I'm allocating my media relay address. As far as your local candidates, like the reflexive and the um, internal IP address, your client generates those automatically because they can determine that. Um, so in, in the initial um, request from the client to the server, the client will send a username, and the username was what they were provided in that MRAS authentication, and the username is going to be stored by the Edge server for the subsequent messages. So um, the, the important thing, media on the Edge is, is, not, is using SRTP, but it's not really using the certificates as much as it is a hash and, and username and password algorithm that everybody has to negotiate on. So that's often a, a confusing thing there, but really the, these username and password um, attributes are used to encrypt and decrypt the, the media on either end. Um, one thing, if you're ever troubleshooting this or looking through it, the first request always fails. So um, when the, if you know, go back here, when I sent my initial allocate request, I, I didn't send a lot of attributes. I just sent a username and, a, and basically a blank request. And a message integrity attribute is required for a valid provisioning requ uh, allocate request, so it fails. But this acts as a connectivity check. Um, and what the message integrity attribute is, and again, this, I get into like a long winded thing about this in the resource kitbook, but basically that's what's used by the server and client when relaying media traffic. Um, and that's a hash of the username and password. So that message integrity is the key thing there. They, then the, the user will, will use that hash to do the encryption. Um, and as you can see, now that I've validated that I can talk to the Edge server for allocate requests, I send an actual valid allocate request. So this has a message integrity attribute, which is a hash of the username and password. Um, and now the Edge server will say, okay, you have everything that you need here, the nonce, the realm, the message integrity. I'll actually look at that and validate that you can, um, you can, you can allocate with me and make calls. So then the Edge server looks and says, all right, we off that, we gave out these MRAS credentials for this user. Um, and I can give them IP addresses because it's valid. If these were not valid, if this was a, uh, you know, some type of attempt to do that, it would obviously fit them. Um, at this point, finally, after everything's been negotiated on, the Edge server responds with an allocate response packet. And basically that response packet has my AV Edge um, port, uh, IP address and port to use. So what this says is when I go to make a call, when I send my media relay candidate, I'm going to send this IP and this port. So the Edge server knows that I'm allowed to use that IP and port. Um, And something to think of, um, the magic cookie attribute is actually used is kind of important too for the, the mapped XOR mapped address. And what this helps do is actually if um, packets are getting manipulated in some type of packet inspection, this can help the client um, XOR that backwards and get the correct IP address that they need. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on under the scenes here to make sure that call is established. It's pretty crazy that all for Stun and uh, for, for Nat really was where this came in. People said, hey, we have, SIP can work when we have direct connectivity, but we need to make sure that it can work for the average home user that has these public internet connections. So a lot of stuff going on here behind the scenes. <coughs> um, so some extra information on that, what I just talked about, basically all of this happens before the SIP invite. So you'll see, even when you're actually looking at the snooper log, you'll see this, the first thing you'll see is the SIP invite, but if you did a Wireshark trace, you'd see all this other activity going on behind the scenes. Um, um, and also another important thing, although the Edge server just allocated those ports, or that single port to the user, it's 
ACL. So this is one of the security things, and this is in the security deck too, but basically it's still secure. It's only accessible by that client IP address and only with valid authentication information. So even though it just gave open that 5187 port, it's not really open unless it's from my client with my credentials. Um, at this point, <coughs> the SIP invites finally sent from the user to actually make the call. So any questions on that? That was kind of a loaded topic on how allocation happens, but um, uh, I'm going to take a second to take a drink anyway so I can keep talking. Yeah. Um, okay, so <clears throat> this is where ICE comes in, and this is what I was talking, oops, sorry, uh, talking about with... Um, this is actually a trace from my machine, so you can see how overcomplicated my candidate was. But this is the AV Edge. So another important thing to remember is that um, Link prefers UDP for media. However, it will use TCP as a fallback option. Obviously, TCP, because of the it, it relying on the state of the connections, and, and it, it just results in poor audio quality, but it gives audio instead of having it fail. So you'll send TCP ports, which these are the ABH TCP ports. Um, you'll send my reflexive addresses. So in this scenario, my public router address was this one here, and this was my internal IP address. So that tells if they were to use this reflexive address, that's how to reach me. Contact this IP and send in there that I'm going to be going to talk to this guy. And I actually had a discussion with somebody about this on, a, on the um, on the next top site, and basically the question was, how is that reflexive address defined, right? So what opens the port? And basically what happens if if I'm sitting on, like today, I'm sitting on my home network, I'll actually send an outbound connection, and that opens up a port to reply to on my home router. So that's how we get those NAT connections in. Even though my home router is technically all blocked off, no firewall ports open to allow traffic, if I open up an outbound connection, I can receive replies. So that's how, um, how we do that there to make sure that edge works. Um, again, more TCP addresses, reflexive TCP in case UDP fails. And then these are my internal interface IPs, my host IP addresses. You can see, I'll tell you right now, these were the only valid ones, these bottom two. The rest of these were my VMware addresses. So you can kind of see that it, it, it can get out of hand um, if, if you're looking at this. Um, now, um, so that was the person sending the invite, the caller. Um, now, this is the callee, and a SIP 200 OK message says, all right, I have your candidates, here's mine. Um, this here is the reflexive address, and why I've highlighted that is, is typically um, pretty much 100% of the time, probably 99% of the time, if you have two external users sitting at home or wherever they are, coffee shops, they'll talk on their reflexive addresses. The goal is actually not to relay this stuff through the edge because you think about the overhead of having to go all the way to the edge server and relay the traffic and then the processing resources on the edge. So the goal is to get these any clients to talk directly as much as possible, but if they can't, we can relay it. Um, so these reflexive addresses are very common to be used by external users because they don't require any relaying, and users can almost always connect through home now. Um, this highlights, uh, this, this red box here is highlighting the, the reflexive address that this user received in the 200 OK. Um, basically, at this point, this is where, um, if you look back at my diagram, we had um, some these, these red lines here, these stun binding requests. Um, basically, these are, are packets sent. Uh, now that we have these candidate lists, I'm gonna, we need to validate connectivity back and forth. So we need to get a two-way path that's going to work to send media. Um, and these are stun binding requests. They're essentially pings on the media port. So, and a very important thing to know is that these go in, a, in an ordered um, pair of priority. So, this this is the this is the priority. Basically, UDP direct, which is the most preferred method, is to have the two internal interfaces talking together on UDP. That typically only happens when you have two internal users. UDP NAT, which is the reflexive that I was just discussing, where um, two users can contact over UDP through NAT addresses, then UDP relay, and then TCP relay as a very last resort. 
So this really quick to jump back to my VPN thing. If you notice, when you connect your VPN, you have an internal interface IP address that's UDP. So it's the highest priority IP address, technically, your, your VPN address. So that's why VPN clients with Link are a problem. Um, basically, um, let's see, there's, like I said, it's just a, this is a, a capture that shows um, stun binding requests on those ports for media, um, testing this stuff out back and forth. Um, you won't see any of this in Snooper. You'll see this in Wireshark if you're actually looking for it. Um, what you will see in Snooper, oops, sorry, I'll get back here, is after the validation happens. So we've, we're now talking about allocation. This is the negotiation process, and then we're going to validate a pair of ports. And this happens once I once I hit something, it stops testing. So if I validate UD NAT, uh, UDP NAT, I no longer test these addresses because I don't care about them. I'm, I know that I can contact on this one. So anyways, from that point, we uh, get into candidate promotion. This is something you can search for in Snooper, and this is a very helpful troubleshooting tool um, to basically be able to see where communications went. Um, so a, a re-invite is sent, another SIP invite, and you're going to have a thing called remote candidates. So search for remote batch candidates, and this means I'm sending my invite. This is what I'm going to talk to you on. Um, and then when you reply back on the 200 OK, this is what you're going to I'm going to talk to you on. So they, this is just kind of the validation that these are what we talked about, and now we're going to talk on these ports. Finally, after all of this stuff, media will start flowing. Um, so this is all usually milliseconds happening. Um, but basically, this shows a uh, an, uh, an RTP payload with an RT audio codec. Um, if you did a Wireshark trace, you'd be able to see that this is RTP with RT audio. Obviously, you can't listen to it. You can't decrypt it because um, it's all SRTP unless you did some funky stuff with Wireshark and certificates and, and everything. So, um, oh, it's a duplicate slide, isn't it? Sorry about that. Um, okay, so we have media. Now, um, this is where the sit by comes in. If um, somebody closes the window, ends the call, whatever happens, all of those port allocations are cleaned up, meaning they stop listening, they go away, they free up for future calls. Um, and if another cool thing, if a monitoring server is deployed, a SIP service message is sent. If you guys are familiar with the monitoring server, that kind of captures everything that you could ever want to know about a call. And you'll be able to see it in a service message with a big chunk of information. So the reason I'm showing you this is if you ever um, are in a, if you, a cool little trick is if you copy this and paste uh, and save it as a, an XML file, you can actually open it right in Internet Explorer and have it be readable. Um, obviously, if you have access to the reporting server, it's much easier just to go to the reporting server. But this allows you, if you don't have access, if you just tr help them troubleshoot, you can just open this up really quick and, and easily read that there was this much jitter, this much packet loss, things like that. So any questions about that? Um, that's kind of a... A big long thing. I thought I had inserted more questions decks there, but um, that's the phase. That's the media process, and this process happens for audio, video, and desktop sharing because desktop sharing and link goes to the AV edge. Okay. Um, all right. So the next slide that I have is actually on the 50k port range. Again, just another reference slide, but basically, this has always been up in the air back with, from R1 to R2. It was like a big security hole or a big problem to open these ranges. Um, but now, what these are essentially used for is federation and then also desktop sharing and file transfer. And this table actually provides you with a, a matrix of what you need to do. So if I'm federating with... Live Messenger, I don't, I need to open it outbound. Typically with Link, we need to open those RTP and TC, uh, sorry, UD, uh, TCP ports outbound. For the most basic scenario with Link. If I'm federating with an R1 cup client, um, I need to open them inbound as well. So if your organization knows that you have, may have R1 partners that you want to do audio with, you gotta open those inbound. Um, but, but, Every link deployment should have these open outbound, basically, to enable all functionality, including sharing and file transfer. 
that's another thing that got um, jumped over to the edge in Link was the file transfer as well, in case you guys weren't aware of that. They got rid of that horrible FTP requirement and opening up ports, and then we'll relay it through the edge server so it actually works. Um, so any questions about the 50K port range? That's usually a big one that... Um, this is, this one usually helps figure that out for most people, but the simplest is just open it outbound, um, and you're good. Okay, and another deck that I like to show is, um, and this one's been circulated around before, but this is basically some security considerations for the edge. So when you start deploying one of these at any company, this is always a big thing around security, right? Because security guys see this port range and go crazy and, People are breaking through my firewall and doing media. Um, so a couple things. Requirements around the AV Edge that relate to security. Um, the AV Edge must have routable IP addresses. You're allowed to use NAT, but you need to have a, a public IP address and be able to NAT that IP address in um, if you need to. You cannot use NAT if you're doing hardware load balancing. That's another important thing to, to think about. And obviously a firewall is okay and encouraged. We don't want to just open up the edge server to the internet. We want it firewalled, but we need to open up specific ports. Um, another question that usually comes up is how is this stuff really um, um, protected? So even though those 3478 and 443 are always listening, um, they're encrypted using, uh, they're protected using the digest authentication, obviously like I showed you when I, my username and my password. Um, the lifetime is actually eight hours um, for my token, so it's only valid for eight hours. And the nonce attribute is actually used to prevent replays, so you can't have any type of attack going on there and, and actually in, in the middle. Um, <clears throat> Um, one thing to note, too, that I actually ran into before, and I think I have a blog post up about this that kind of really shows off the security of this, is I had a customer with two AV Edge pools, and DNS names got mixed up in somewhere so that um, users in pool one were actually trying to connect to pool two, and it would deny their request for media. So because it did not match that uh, digest authentication, it actually wouldn't even let them connect. So it's kind of cool to see that even though we talked about it being secure, it really is secure. Um, even a user who is a valid link user, if they don't have the right username and password attributes, they can't make calls. Um, and then that 50 port range, that 50k port range, again, it's a dynamic port allocation. They're never, they're not listening ports. You can never tell that to them. Um, also, it is an IP filter based um, ACL when those ports are allocated, which we discussed before. So that's about as secure as it gets. Um, oh, hang on a second. Something's going on here. Sorry. Am I still on with you guys? Yeah, it is. Okay. My computer just tried to shut down, so yeah. who knows what that's all about. Um, this damn Windows stuff, you know? Um, and then, of course, media is protected by SRTP, like we discussed. So you don't have to worry about anybody listening in on media and, and, and decrypting or listening in and hearing the conversations. So um, this deck here is the links and resources. This is the one that I'll, um, you know, I'll share with you guys. This is the stuff I was talking about with the MS Turn and MS Ice 2 that talks about what they've done to change the IETF protocol. And inside of this, they link to the original RFCs as well, so you can compare um, what's different that they've done. And um, this link here is the resource kit uh, for external user access. I definitely encourage it. Um, it's a what I, it's kind of what I just covered, only for every little scenario um, in a bit more detail as well, a lot more detail around the authentication methods. Um, and, of course, the best resource is always the next top site. Um, the, the whole Dr. Ez team thing is really doing a good job of keeping everybody informed. Um, and look out for that blog post on VPN. I probably guess by the end of November we're drafting up right now. So um, any questions at all or anything that, you know, that I didn't cover or anything related to the edge that you've had on your minds or anything like that? Yeah, I'll ask one. Um, so you prefer hardware or um, DNS load balancing on the edge? Um, it's definitely, with Link, it's much easier to do DNS load balancing. 
Um, the hardware load balancing, if you have R2 clients, you need to keep hardware load balancing in until you have all linked clients. Also, another thing to consider is if you're federating with partners that are not on link, they don't know how to do DNS load balancing. Um, also, at this time, Exchange UM doesn't know how to do DNS load balancing, unless they fix that in a later, later service pack, but I thought that it was still unaware of it. So there's some caveats there, but in most scenarios, DNS load balancing is definitely the best. I mean, you're talking about just configuring a couple A records instead of worrying about all this HLB's traffic. Um, one scenario that I know of that really is very complicated and not likely, but we did run into it, is an issue with NAT and DNS load balancing um, and multiple edge servers. And some there's an application sharing issue there. So if you have a big complicated deployment, it's best to run it um, <laughs> to run it through uh, Microsoft. They have it filed as a bug. But basically, if I remember right, the scenario is two is you have say you have two edge servers using DNS load balancing. If one user allocates on one edge server and one on the other, they weren't able to share media, and that was happening frequently. Um, and so there's some there's still some caveats there around where that can happen, but I think they're looking to fix it. So um, most scenarios, though, DNS load balancing all the way. It makes it so much easier, um, so much more less to rely on as far as um, not to, you know, it's always just harder working with another team or another piece of hardware um, in the environment to make it all work, so. Thanks. Great, so um, this is, I have my contact information here too. You can definitely reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm always open to helping with anything, answering any questions on either email, Twitter, or uh, send me an IM, add me to your contact list if you want. Um, we have Open Federation and Unified Square, so you can reach me anytime. Um, there's a lot more to this edge stuff, and it's usually a long learning curve. For I feel like I'm still learning stuff about it every day, so we're um, I'm definitely more than happy to spread out the knowledge, though. Great to you up. Uh, maybe mention or spell out your email address. It's in blue. It's, I don't know if it's hard to read. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's um, it's R Wintel R W I N T L E at unifysquare.com, and that's U N I F Y square.com. And my SIP address is the same thing. So it's um, you can reach me either on link or through email with that. Thanks, Randy. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. It was good to do this, and I'll have to get down there um, for another one of these meetings sometime. I've been trying to find a good excuse to come hang out, so just got to get another one. Just got to get close enough. I'm up here in Maine, so it's kind of a long flight unless I'm in the area. Well, Dallas is much warmer right now. I'll, yeah, you know, I, I actually just I came from Nashville today. This morning, my flight was from Nashville. And it was 80 degrees, and I got here, and it's 40 and raining. So I'd rather go back to that weather for sure. Hey, anytime, Randy. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. I'll drop it back off to you guys, let you do whatever you normally do. But um, like I said, please do reach out to me if you have any questions, and um, we'll talk to you soon. I appreciate I really appreciate you guys letting me do this, and I'll, um, I'll send off the recordings to you guys as well in, in the decks um, right here in a minute. Wonderful. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.